just not put this one out. I don't want to get assassinated. This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important. You know that. And you can protect yourself online with guess who? Yes, Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. Welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. I am the boy with the blade. This is a show where Danny has written me a script. This one is all about, I literally am finding this out now, incredible inventions that people have claimed to have made. Oh boy, like the car that runs on water. It's like he was killed by big oil. He wasn't, you can't run a car on water. I mean, you can, but you have to do like this whole process to make the water into hydrogen, which uses more energy. It's like, it's not magic. If cars come on water, they would be. <laughs> Let's look at some other crazy sh people have come up with. I'm gonna read it like I'm about to do. And Sam is gonna sprinkle in some fine vintage memes. He calls himself a video editor. You all know exactly who I am. Say my name. We all know he is just a meme specialist. I think I can say with reasonable conviction that mankind will never discover how to travel backwards in time. Otherwise, we'd already be constantly bumping into, bumping into visitors from the future unless, unless we need to get to some point where we develop the machine that allows people to come back in time. Like this would be interesting, right? Like we can't travel back in time to now, but if there's a machine we invent in the future that is some way for people to come back in time too, then it's like, that's the beginning. I find this super interesting. I did once receive an unusual visit from a guy he looked a bit like an older and grubbier version of me. He kept banging on about lottery numbers and how I should remember to cancel my Amazon Prime membership after the trial period has expired and how I should avoid ever visiting Prague at all costs. <laughs> you should have listened to him, Danny! I was like, I signed up to Amazon Prime. I live in, in Prague. And uh, I was like, oh, this sounds really good. This sounds really good. I get like Amazon Prime video. This was like two years ago or something, three years ago. Get Amazon Prime video, you can get free delivery, you get all this stuff. So I sign up. It's like, it cost me like 50 euros or something. I think it was a month for free. And so I log into the video and it's like, it's not available in your region. I'm like, well, at least to get free delivery, not available in your region. Music, not available in your region. So that was a fucking lie. So why advertise it to me, Amazon, you fucks? <laughs> I thought he was just loony and told him to mind his own business, and then he screamed back at me that this was exactly what he was doing. Uh, looking back, I don't think I should have been quite so hard on myself. But what if we could travel back in time purely to view historical events without physically interacting with them? A bit like the holodeck thing on Star Trek. I mean, they're not yet... Well, someone's got to program it. It's not like the holodeck is a magical time, like, looking in the past machine. It's like someone is... It's like a book. Someone has written the program. We can never see past the choices we don't understand. Not so much a fully operational time machine, but more of a kind of time TV. Danny, that's not how the holodeck works. Not what holodeck is. Come on, Danny. Don't expect you to have any knowledge of Star Wars, but Star Trek, come on, that's the good one. Well, according to a bunch of Catholic priests and- Oh, I know this. This is someone who invent said they invented a time visor and they went back and saw Jesus or something like that. It's like, no, you didn't. Stop. Fucking lying. And surely nobody would ever doubt the word of the cloth. Such a machine exists. But the bad news is that it's locked away in the Vatican since the 1950s and nobody's allowed to play with it. It's a shame that the Vatican's rules aren't quite as strict when it comes to choir boys. <laughs> oh shit! Throw in the shade! I don't think we can really say that because this is like, you know, major sexual crimes by a giant institution. We can't really make fun. It's like, <laughs> Catholic Church, what are you up to? <laughs> Stop it. Father Francis Bone spilled the beans on the development of the Chronovisor in 2002 in a book entitled Le Nouveau Mysterio de Vatican, Vatican, or The Man of Vatican's New Mystery. Oh, mon dieu. Oh, de fouf. He recalls how he was enjoying a boat ride across the Grand Canal in Venice during the 1960s when a Benedictine monk by the name of Father Pellegrini <laughs> <laughs> and the conversation turned to biblical interpretations. Father Pellegrino Ernetti later uh, declared that there was no longer a need to debate such interpretations or theories or allegories. He could just hop back in time and view history exactly as it happened, which is handy. <laughs> I know he couldn't. Stop it. Danny, did we just get immediately into the content today? I'm impressed. <laughs> 
Danny, what the fuck, man? A former physicist, he reckons that he had built a secret machine in the 1950s which could photograph the past. He didn't do this alone. He had help from no less than 12 of the world's greatest scientists, including Enrico Fermi, who won the 1938 Nobel Prize in Physics, and Werner von Braun, a German rocket scientist and former Nazi SS member who went on to collaborate with the US and play a key role in getting man to the moon. The chronovisor was apparently a large cabinet with a cathode ray tube equipped with buttons and levers, which allowed the viewer to select a specific time and location. Several antennae forged from mysterious metals were planted onto the gadget, and these picked up the pro uh, processed residual electromagnetic radiation from history, catching echoes of the past and reproducing them on the viewing screen in pictures and sounds. This guy was actually a physicist. A physicist of what? Nonsense! I'm a physicist with a sub specialization in crap. Of course, this begs the question, what would you watch if you had the whole of history at your fingertips? I mean, it's got to be better than Netflix. I wouldn't have mind having a peek at a bit of dinosaur wrestling, or maybe you just go right back to the beginning of creation to see exactly how the Rolling Stones first got together. Is that an interesting story? I don't know. I mean, I, uh, some of the Rolling Stones music's pretty good, but I don't really know anything about them. Before the Pellegrino and his Bible bashing chums were mostly interested in catching up on biblical events such as the Last Supper, the crucifixion of Christ. Oh my god. Boring! <laughs> Which I'm led to believe is turns into quite a tough watch towards the end. You could just watch that movie with, I don't know who's in it. There's some movie where he plays Jesus and he's on a cross or some <laughs> The crucifix crucifixion of Christ? Something like that. It's, it, I've never seen it because it sounds terribly boring. Uh, he also claims to have seen Marcus Tullius Cicero's speech uh, to the Roman Senate in 63 BC, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, a rousing speech by Napoleon Bonaparte, and a performance in Rome in 169 BC of the legendary long-lost tragedy uh, Thyestes by Quintus Ennius, the father of Latin poetry. If all this sounds a bit dodgy, oh boy, does it! I should point out that Father Pellegrino provided evidence. I'm gonna go ahead and make the bold, I say bold prediction, that this evidence is easily refutable like without really any thought by someone with more than an IQ of seven. For example, he took the time to take a quick snapshot of Jesus. Long before the revelations of the 2002 book were written by his priest buddy, Father Pellegrino had taken his story to an Italian weekly newspaper called La Domenica del Corriere, and they ran the headline, a machine that photographs the past has finally been invented. <laughs> This like, like the tabloid of Italy. The paper later published a moody black and white shot of Jesus captured by the time hopping monk. <laughs> Father Pellegrino had also made a full text transcription of the Thyestes play so that everyone could enjoy this lost masterpiece in full for the first time in over a couple of millennia where you just happened to remember it all. <laughs> if there was any lingering doubt over Father Pellegrino's claims, I suppose somebody could have just asked two of the highly acclaimed world leading scientists who helped build the project, say Enrico Fermi or Werner von Braun. But sadly, they both died before their names were publicly linked with the project. How convenient. Still, photographic evidence counts, doesn't it? No when it looks like this. <laughs> I just, I mean, I mean, it's just a photo. How can, it's like me taking a photograph of myself now and being like, yeah, that's a photo of me from last week. It's not. This could just be a photo of anything. It's probably like a photo of just some, I don't know, picture, painting of Jesus. Well, it might be a bit more convincing if the photo of Jesus hadn't just been uh, a reversed image of a postcard produced by the Italian town of Colla Valenza, which had itself been based on a wood carving by the sculptor Lorenzo Calla Valera. Shocking. Still, there's that transcription of the lost plate, which he could have just entirely made up. But when this was analyzed by Dr. Catherine Elred, an expert on Thyestes from Princeton University, she concluded that Father Pellegrino had composed the text himself. I could have concluded that, and I don't go to Princeton. Based on her findings that the play was far too short and contained Latin words that wouldn't even come into usage until 200 years after it was meant to have been written. Whoops. Tadagio! <laughs> What a shock. Your ploy was easily to be easily seen through and the evidence was easily refuted. <laughs> Such a big brain. It's more likely that Father Pellegrino just nicked the whole idea and design from a fictional fictional machine that sounded remarkably similar to what appeared in a 1947 science fiction novella called E for Effort by T. L. Shared. Father Pellegrino died in 1994, and an anonymous relative suggested that although he confessed on his deathbed that the photo and transcription were fake, the chronovisor still very much existed. Dude, why? 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 
Why? His boat sailing buddy, Father Francis Bones, is convinced that the machine is still hidden away in the Vatican and claims in his 2002 book that Pope Pius XII forbade the disclosure of any details of this monumentous discovery. The chronovisor may now well be gathering dust in the secret vaults of the Vatican, along with the Knights Templar scroll, the missing fictional disclaimer of the Bible, the world's largest stash of pornography, and the Business Blaze video about North Korea. Oh! The machine would certainly... Yeah, I recorded a Business Blaze video about North Korea. And I was like, it just got f***ing off the rails like crazy. And I was like, yo. I mean, I don't think I'm going to be assassinated by like, you know, some government or something. But I'm like, boy, that was a mess. That is my doorbell. I'm back. What are we talking about? North Korea. Oh yeah, I just made this video. It just got absolutely mad insulting to North Korea. And I was like, uh, let's just not put this one out. I don't want to get assassinated. And I was like, don't be a coward, because I'm not a journalist. Like, journalists live in fear of getting assassinated and I'm like, fuck that. Machine would certainly have helped settle a few long-running pub debates at the very least, and perhaps such a device will exist one day in the far future. Unlikely. So the next time you're enjoying an intensely private moment, don't forget to wink and give the thumbs up to the grandkids. What's up, guys? Hey! Uh, and as we travel back in time to hear more wild claims of unlikely inventions, be aware that eyes from the future might be watching you. Watching us. Oh god. Not everyone gets along with the traditional condom. Some people don't like the fiddly fumbling about, and some penises come in different sizes that don't quite fit the mold, while other penises belong to Catholics. <laughs> oh shit. We're really, uh, we're really firing in all cylinders at Catholics today. But back in 2006, one German sexual health educator by the name of Jan Vincenz Kraus thought that he had come up with a cunning new solution, the spray on condom. Jan was working at the German Institute for Condom Consultancy at the time, then he found that he was often getting asked by frustrated men why condoms can't be made in custom sizes. As he was driving through a car wash one day, Jan suddenly felt inspired to draw upon a similar principle to design the world's first spray on condom. Why do we have to know, just say he came up with an idea? Why do we know he was in a car wash? Weird. The package would consist of an application chamber and a cartridge of liquid latex which could create around 20 condoms. The idea is that you fill up the chamber with liquid, then shove your wang into the application chamber where it suddenly gets sprayed from all directions by plastic nozzles to create the perfect fitting condom every time. Just give it a little wiggle for the liquid latex to set and you're good to go. This sounds pretty smart, if extremely complicated. The answer at the time, the condom fits 100% perfectly so the safety is much higher than a standard condom and it feels more natural. He also reckoned that they'd have plenty of fun testing the new device outside of office hours. Oh sh**, Jan. Um, also, th yeah, I mean, this sounds great, but like, I mean, so does the chronovisor. <laughs> That'd be brilliant. So it's totally fake. But there were a few problems during the testing stage. For starters, the application chamber made aggressive hissing noises when you switched it on, and most of the volunteers were too scared to put their penises anywhere near the contraption. Oh no! Why, why are you looking down there? Why are you looking down there? Keep your eyes above. No, what are you doing? Uh, Some of them were brave enough to test it out on their fingers, but even that took some persuasion to be like, rawr, rawr, rawr. I'm not putting my willy in there. It's not happening. What if it doesn't come out? I just got off my dick. Jeremy, is this a fucking prank? Don't be stupid. Come on, show me your dick. I got my dick! Becky! I got my dick! Ah! The actual application process took about a minute, but then you had to hang around for a further three minutes to wait for the liquid latex to harden. And three minutes is an agonizingly long time in that situation. It's difficult to imagine how you'd cope during those early stages of rampant excitement if suddenly you had to stop, shove your knob into a terrifying portable car wash for a minute, and then hang around for three minutes just staring at it and waiting for it to set. Maybe that would be a good time to do an ad read or something. All right then, this video is brought to you by- this is not what I plan to do because I don't read these ahead and I don't know where things go, but we're doing it. We're absolutely doing it. Surfshark, yes. Look, do you use the internet? Of course you do, friend. You're on the internet right now. What's that? Do you have personal information that you'd rather remain private? Yeah, you do. You're like Googling like custom condom sizes for small willies. You want that private. You know you do. Well, let me tell you something. The internet's a weird place. People are out there. They'll instill your identity, your information, whatever. Oh, yes. It's a pain in the ass. Surfshark has something called a hack lock, which searches database, make sure that your passwords are not leaking out of there, not rounding them out of the internet, allowing people to access your shit. No one wants that. But look, it's not just about safety and security. It's about entertainment. It's about how much joy you can squeeze out of the internet. Now, let me tell you a little story. There's this service called Netflix. 
You can access Netflix from whichever your country, whichever country you're in. For example, me here. I'm in Prague in the Czech Republic, and the Netflix selection I always thought was pretty excellent until I looked up a web article and it was like, yo, 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 fat boy, in the United States of America. You know how much Netflix they've got? Thousands of shows. You know how much Netflix you've got? Hundreds. It's an order of magnitude less fact, boy. I was like, oh my god. Well, good news. Random internet article. I've got Surfshark. Guess right. I always, I always choose Miami. I'm always like, where do I want to go out of? Miami! Because once it was the cocaine capital of the world. Also, it's in that Will Smith song. Welcome to Miami. Ha ba 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 Miami. <laughs> so, okay, Will, chill out. I went to Miami once. It's all right. It was weird. There was, uh, there's a place like along the beach and all of the restaurants have like this food outside so you know what the food you look like, you, you order is going to look like. It's really weird and it seems like all plasticky and strange and you go in and I guess they give you food that looks like that. It's just like very curious. That was Miami. I'm pretty sure that was Miami. I got terribly sunburned. Uh, so yeah, look, you can use Surfshark wherever you're based to go get more Netflix choices or different Netflix choices, all of that sort of stuff. Also, you know, if you uh, if you just want to pirate shit, can I say that? No. Also, what's another thing? Like, imagine, I know not not right now, but you've been looking up the price of flights. And have you, have you ever noticed when you go back to the website and it's like the flight is just more expensive because they know you want to take it? Well, first of all, open an incognito browser, browser, fire up Surfshark VPN, go over to a different country or a different location or whatever, and just see if you can get a better price because you might find that you absolutely can. That's what Surfshark's about. And you can get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below, or just use my channel code, BLAZE, B-L-A-Z-E. In case you don't know how to spell blaze, in, in which case I'm slightly concerned about you. Okay, ad read over. The high price tag, about twice the cost of regular condoms, also meant that this was always going to be a hard sell, and the project appears to have quickly shriveled up in 2008. However, maybe the idea isn't entirely without merit as I write this script. Durex is gearing up to launch spray on condoms in the very near future, and this stuff appears to squirt straight out of a spray can, which sounds like an improvement on the cacophonous car wash concept. It sounds as if they're coming soon to a chemist near you. That's kind of cool. Meanwhile, Yan also abandoned his later plan to develop a remote-controlled bra for the really clumsy or lazy-ass lover, and it says settle down on producing a range of condoms that are just available in different sizes. Genius! Now that's a clever idea. Uh, oh, that's where I was. We were going to have the ad read here. So actually, this is kind of kind of okay place for it. A uh, synthetic trachea, trachea, trachea. It's this thing, right? Sweet. I've always wanted one of those. How innovative! I like it. This has got to be one of the most catastrophic examples in recent history of invention that failed to live up to the creator's hype. Paolo Macarini. Macchiarini is a Swiss-born Italian thoracic surgeon with a remarkable CV which encompasses degrees and stints as a researcher and surgeon and professor in prestigious universities and institutions around the world. By the time he was settling down in the new role of visiting professor at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden in 2011, which is, which by the way is possibly the most acclaimed medical university in the world, as it decides who wins the Nobel Prizes in Physiology and Medicine, Paolo was already a bit of a celebrity. He claimed to have invented a pioneering new medical technology for patients who were having severe problems breathing with a dodgy windpipe or a trachea. The idea of trachea transplant was always considered a tough nut to crack in medical science, and even today would only ever be considered as a faintly desperate last resort. Not only does the patient need to hang around waiting for a suitable donor, but even when a donor is found, there's a very serious risk of the body rejecting the donated organ and causing further serious long-term problems down the line. So Paolo's new synthetic trachea sounded like a giant medical breakthrough. His first experiment in 2008 on a patient from Barcelona called Claudia Castillo eventually involved stripping away the cells of a windpipe taken from a deceased donor, and then seeding the bare scaffold with cells taken from Claudia's own bone marrow cells, eliminating the risk of biological rejection. I've heard of this. This was, I, I know this is a technology they've been playing around for a, for a while, like using um, like the, the scaffold of the organ or the piece of the body to, and then the bone marrow cells being building upon it. So cool. <laughs> Later experiments got rid of the need for a donor altogether as Paolo unveiled his completely new synthetic trachea, which seemed to indicate a new custom plastic airway could be fitted inside patients and help transform their lives without the need to wait for somebody to throw a seven. And in theory, the discovery had the potential to work with other replacement organs too. It seems as if Paolo was on the brink of reshaping organ transplantation in a big way. Yeah, if we crack this nut, it would be absolutely insane. 
insanely cool. Paolo was now becoming a medical science rock star as news of his amazing operations generated headlines on the front page of the New York Times. NBC commissioned an investigative documentary into the life of the suave and charming surgeon, which they called a leap of faith, but things turned a bit weird in that department when Benita Alexander, the award-winning producer who had been assigned to put the project together, ended up falling in love with her subject and agreeing to marry him. Oh no! I mean, okay, you know, that doesn't seem like... I don't think there's an ethical problem there, but there's going to be a conflict of interest now, isn't there? Still, it sounds as if the wedding bash is going to be something quite special. Paolo reckoned that the ceremony would be officiated by none other than Pope Francis. Shit! While the VIP guest list includes some of Paolo's closest celebrity buddies, including the Clintons, the Obamas, and Vladimir Putin. That is a, that is a guest list, isn't it? <laughs> but this is when things started to unravel. For starters, it turns out that much of Paolo's impressive CV had been completely fabricated. Oh, dude! <laughs> When contacted, many of the universities denied that Paolo had ever earned the qualifications that he boasted, or even served in the illustrious professional positions that he had claimed. Dude, you were just a con man? That's insane! That is so bold! He was certainly a qualified surgeon, okay, well at least there's that, but his appointment as visiting professor to the prestigious Karolinska Institute was perhaps not entirely justified. That fancy wedding never happened either. His fiancée Benita eventually discovered that despite his claims, Paolo had no social connections at all with the Clintons or the Obamas or Putins or the Pope. <laughs> that is so crazy! He also, also he failed to disclose to Benita that he was already married and had been for 30 years. <laughs> this guy is just a, a con man. Shit. But the biggest problem was that Paolo's amazing synthetic trachea didn't seem to work. It's believed that Paolo performed the procedure up on 20 different patients, and all except two of them died shortly afterwards. Oh my god. Even the two survived. How many patients? 20. Dude, your procedure killed the people. Did it? I mean, allegedly. Or were they going to die anyway, and then he was just like, gave it a shot. Even the surviving two patients aren't exactly enjoying the best of health today. Now, we should be a little careful with our words here. Yes, <laughs> all of this is definitely very much alleged. Because uh, it has not yet been proven that a patient died as a direct result of Paolo's procedures. But it has to be said that 18 deaths out of 20 procedures is hardly the most compelling recommendation for the synthetic trachea. Yeah, you can say that again. Allegedly. In my opinion. <laughs> Seems to be. Uh, it's been alleged that Paolo... It's been alleged... <laughs> The Paolo deliberately exaggerated any positive health results on his patients while desperately trying to bury the negative results. <laughs> like any good scientist would. That's a joke. An approach which would become quite tricky when his patients began dying in droves around him. Allegedly! The alarming part of the story is that the Karolinska Institute went out of their way to defend their superstar surgeon in the wake of those emerging allegations. Wait, I thought he didn't even go to the Karolinska Institute. <laughs> what an incredible con man. You did it. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. Perhaps part of the problem is that windpipe repair is such a niche specialty that nobody else higher up the chain really understood what Paolo is even meant to be doing. <laughs> it's good when you're on top and no one else understands, so you can just be like, yeah, whatever. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. He was pretty much given free reign to carry out his highly experimental procedures without gaining the necessary clearance from external authorities and agencies, without risk analysis, without rigorous testing, without following up the usual, without following the usual protocols. <laughs> Look, I understand that surely there's got to be some way to deal with this, because I know the people at the, uh, you know, that the people who decide when you can do clinical trials and stuff. They're not all going to understand the intricacies of every single drug. There's going to be like experts they consult and all of this to get a full picture. Shouldn't they be doing that at least? I feel like science has got this one down already, haven't we? Uh, it was as if his supposed celebrity status had given him a free pass through all the usual red tape. It definitely shouldn't. Yet despite an independent investigation finding him guilty of scientific misconduct, the Karolinska Institute stood by their star surgeon for several more years as if it'd done nothing more serious than take a few naughty shortcuts. <laughs> Seems like a bit more than that, doesn't it, allegedly? The Institute eventually decided to terminate Paolo's contract in 2018. In the following year, Paolo was handed a suspended 16-month prison sentence after being found guilty of abuse of office and forging official documents. I found out that suspended prison sentence is basically where you don't actually have to go to prison. So it's just kind of like 16 months in prison. And then you're like, ah, oh, come on, come on, come on, suspended. Yes! Fucking <laughs> A! Off I go home! Although, like, 16-month prison sentence. Are they going to take away your medical license? I feel like they probably are. You're not a doctor. You're a big, fat, curly-headed fuck. After being found guilty of abuse of office and forging official documents. But this certainly dealt a massive blow to the credibility of the people who hand out those Nobel Prizes and to Swedish clinical research in general. Following another investigation into his synthetic trachea products, the surgeon now faces fresh charges in Sweden of aggravated assault on his largely doomed patients due to the great suffering that he made them endure. So it's possible that the surgeon who appeared to be lost in his own bizarre Bud Light fantasies, but a bum bum tsh o g b b, may uh, yet be held properly to account for his allegedly unethical behavior but don't hold your breath. Final one, no answer. 
Finally, to conclude on a slightly lighter note that doesn't involve gasping for air through a dodgy plastic windpipe during your final death throes. <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, let's take a look at a revolutionary take on the answering machine. Do we even, do people use on? I don't I, I don't know. If I have a voicemail on my phone, I have never checked it. Not a single once in my life. I don't even know the number to dial to check the voicemail. Because I'm like, yo, if I don't pick up the phone, send me a quick text message, right? Need for an answering machine is at, I don't, at, at home, I don't have a home phone. Who has a home phone? Nobody. In an old Business Place video on talkie pictures and other passing fads, we talked about how it took an extraordinarily long period of time for something as simple as a phone answering machine to really catch on with the general public. It seems like such a relatively simple concept to pull off, yet there were teething problems with the strangely clunky and makeshift models that were produced in the 1960s, and the situation wasn't helped by the United States uh, American telefo Telephone and Telegraph Company's complete monopoly on the telephone service, which effectively erected a legal barrier to third-party suppliers providing such machines. Ah yes, monopolies. Brilliant for business if you are the business that has a monopoly Shit for everyone else which is why i work so hard to have a monopoly on facts on youtube like the good fact boy i am uh, it wasn't until the 19th not really <laughs> i don't know if there's like a trade commission for like regulating youtube channels i don't i don't i think they'd more be like youtube you're a bit dominant as a video service rather than simon you're dominating facts if they ever come after me be like simon you got a monopoly on facts and be like Job complete, now I can retire. <laughs> You're gonna send me a letter or something? I'll frame that shit. And then I guess I'll have to write you a massive check and break up my empire. Which will be sad, but... C'est la vie! It wasn't until the 1990s that answering machines belatedly became a standard household fixture in the United States, by which time they're already poised to be quickly overtaken by voicemail. Maybe we should have listened to Klaus shots instead. In the late 1950s, the Austrian inventor took a slightly different approach to the answering machine concept. His idea was to build a giant mechanical robot which would lurk in the corner of your living room and answer telephone calls on your behalf. It's kind of terrifying. Why would it be giant? Why does it have to be so big? Klaus? <laughs> Gay! Uh, his MM7 Selector, Human Machine Selector, was apparently also designed to do lots of other things too. It could answer the door, shake hands, pour tea, and would hopefully one day be able to sort out the laundry, do the vacuuming, and eventually evolve into the ultimate mechanical housemate. Dude, this is the 1950s. <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna invent a machine that does all of my chores for me. It's 2021, and that sounds like pie in the sky impossible. Why are you smoking, Klaus? Uh, it's probably crack. It's probably smoking crack. But its main early selling point seemed to be that the robot's wondrous ability to answer the telephone, which is weird as it didn't really do this very well at all. Some say that later models might have featured a miniature tape recorder installed inside the robot's head, but this wasn't on display during any of Klaus's public demonstrations. Instead, the MM7 Selector human machine could just do two things in the phone answering department. For starters, it could pick up the telephone when it began to ring and then wait for it. It could put the receiver back down. So he, he essentially invented a machine that does this. Brilliant, Klaus! You big brain! Now, as a proposed automated message, I'm not sure this quite presses all of the right buttons. <laughs> the robot couldn't talk back, it couldn't play or record a voice message, so if you weren't at home, the robot would greet any callers with radio silence and then not give you the slightest indication that you missed a call when you returned. Brilliant! Perhaps it was designed for people who just can't be asked to pick up the phone themselves even when they're at home, but this would still pose a problem as the phone butler would still be answering the phone in complete silence while you dashed over to try and greet the caller before they hung up in bewilderment. Yeah, I mean, if you're at home and you don't want to answer the phone, just don't answer the phone. Or just unplug it. Or just be like, or like on the on the iPhone or whatever, you just tap the power button and it turns it off and it goes away. <laughs> Which is honestly something I do most of the time. Someone's calling me. Not now. Carl Schultz carried on building his menacing mechanical men until around 1973. But it doesn't look as if he ever made any huge... Who is paying for your life, Carl? Charles? What's his name? Klaus? Who's paying for your life? How do you how do you get to do this for 20 years? I, I am in awe. But it doesn't look as if he ever made any huge advances with a telephone answering robot. Maybe it was better at not making tea and not answering the door. But boom, boom, tss. But may or maybe the machine was deemed to work too well and was seized by the Vatican on the grounds that it was a sacrilegious abomination. It wasn't. It could be lurking somewhere in the Vatican vaults today, quietly taking phone bookings for the private chronovisor matinee screenings of the mischievous school day pranks of Jesus Christ and pals. But boom, boom, tss. this has been an episode of Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze, Simon. This video brought to you by the legend over at Surfshark. Yes, it was, and you can check them out below and use the code BLAZE. If you'd like to get some merch, it's perchthemerch.co. And thank you for watching. Come on, show me your dick. I got my dick, Becky! I got my dick! Ah!